until later on. So Rajiv, it's all yours. All righty. So everybody can hear me? Yes. 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 All right. Now, this is a 55 minute talk. So if you get tired of me talking, just say so and I shall stop. I will not be in the least bit offended. Let me share the screen here. Share. Okay, now, actually I've been a member of HAI for one year and exactly a year ago, I heard my, saw the very first presentation. It was Dick Brown talking about Parkland Tassel. And one of the first things Dick Brown showed us had my jaw dropped to the floor because for years and years, I had been desperate to see any image at all of any portion of the Albuquerque Opera House at any phase of its existence. And I couldn't find a single thing then I watched Dick Brown's presentation and bingo, there it is, Elite Saloon. That was a remaining corner of the Albuquerque Opera House after the theater part had been demolished. So when you look for things desperately, you don't find them. When you stop looking, they come right. Let's see if I can, how do I move this to, ah, there we go. A few months ago, I, I had been wondering for a long time about the earliest theatrical events in Albuquerque in New Mexico. And Diane asked me if I knew about this. This is a master's thesis by Hazel Vineyard, 1941. I wish I had known about this when I was a kid. If I had, I would have called her up and we would have become buddies. Alas, it's too late. Uh, he answered some questions but there was very little she could do because the record is so sparse. She found the earliest plays go back at least as far as 1598. They were very simple, naive Spanish folk dramas. Uh, some of them were comedies based on local events. Others were adapted from mystery plays, nativity plays, passion plays, adapted to local circumstances, which is why they added American Indians to the cast. Uh, this one especially amused me. The three shepherds are on their way to a Mexican fiesta when they notice the Star of Bethlehem beckoning them to the manger. I could not invent something like that if I wanted to. Years ago, when I read Mark Simmons' book, this is the paragraph most called out to me and the, this was the highlight of the book for me. When Stephen Kearney and his troops invaded New Mexico to conquer it for the United States, A, they found there was no conquering they needed to do. When they got to May, they noticed a fiesta. They estimated about 1,500 people there. And some of these people put on a Spanish folk comedy on an improvised stage. And I thought, okay, if they can do that in Tomé, then certainly the same thing was happening in Albuquerque. And I wish I could learn more. I set about trying to, there were any people involved in the Spanish folk theater that were also involved in commercial theater. Was there any confluence? I have not found any evidence of it, but then I've hardly found anything. The record, as I say, is terribly sparse. The railroad got here 1880, and then in 1881, February of 1881, Mark Simmons noticed that there was a traveling minstrel show here. He doesn't footnote this. I don't know where he got the information. I don't know who the traveling minstrels were, how long they stayed, where they performed, if they performed, who was in the audience, where they went. It's total mystery to me. But once the railroad was here, Albuquerque began getting inquiries almost daily from traveling shows asking about possible venues here. In Santa Fe, there's a curious little item. There's a Professor Epstein who pops up once in a while, always in relation to some musical event. This time, Professor Epstein brought over a troupe of 
amateur Albuquerque thespians. Who they were, I don't know. I've never heard of them popping up again. They seem to have vanished into a puff of smoke. And these amateur Albuquerqueans put on a performance of Pinafore on a Saturday. Sunday, they went back home to Albuquerque. Monday morning, they went back to their day jobs. I never found out who Professor Epstein was. Uh, shortly after this, he went to Trinidad, Colorado. I th and then he disappears. He might be Jacob M. Epstein of Troy, Kansas. I haven't got a clue. I would love to research it. I don't know how. If you can help, give me a call. I would love to talk with you. Because there were constant inquiries and railroad and more and more visitors, there were some businessmen among the William B. Childs, who's pictured here, and F.W. Smith of the Atlantic Pacific Railroad, who thought it would be a good idea to build a luxury hotel cum theater. And the, the trail for this gets a little foggy, I think, this evolved several times over. I think the Armijo brothers took this project over later. I think this is what evolved into San Felipe Hotel. I'm not sure. Now, early on, 1881, Albuquerque did have a functioning theater. It was called Armijo Hall, and I had trouble placing it, but when I read a number of newspaper blurbs, lines, descriptions, I finally figured out that Armijo Hall was the banquet room in Armijo House. And the banquet room doubled as a ballroom. It tripled as a theater. It was very tiny. It was dark. There was no gas service, no electrical service. It was lit by candles. And I suspect, let me turn on my pointer here, I suspect it was this little protrusion on the first floor. If we can enlarge it, it's very blurry, but might that say D-I-N-I-N-G room? I can't read it. If you can find a clearer picture of this, let me know, but I suspect that was Armijo Hall. The newspaper collections are incomplete, but we get to this advertisement, which is the first advertisement I could find, Williams Theater Company performed The Hidden Hand at Armijo Hall. And that got me curious. What was the Williams, what was the Williams Theater Company? Were they Albuquerqueans or were they uh, barnstormers from out of town? So I did a little research and a little is all I could do because there's frightfully little information about them. They were barnstormers based somewhere in Kansas. Uh, they played little rural towns, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas. And then suddenly they turn west. They go to Trinidad, Colorado. They turn south. They go to a real theater, Baca Hall in Las Vegas. Turn around again go to the Alhambra in Santa Fe, which is another real theater. They turn south to Albuquerque. And there's no theater in Albuquerque. So they make do with a tiny, dark little banquet room in a hotel. 15 people on stage is probably all that could fit on stage, like sardines in a can. I wanted to learn more. There's nothing more to learn. Uh, the star of the show, Matey Williams died not long after that of tuberculosis. Uh, shortly after that, her husband Wilbur died. We don't have photos, we don't have date books, we don't have diaries, we don't have reminiscences. This is just a big hole in history. I would love to fill it in. I don't think we'll ever be able to. Now in Albuquerque, there was a William Adams Smith who was a bookseller and a stationer. He joined forces with Charles W. Snyder, who was a, an architect and a contractor. They rented a small plot of land owned by Nicholas T. Armijo. And on that small plot of land, they built a one-story wood frame structure 
two shops in the front and a theater in the back. They built this in 22 days. Uh, so it's apparent this was a ramshackle building. It was not meant to last. It was just a temporary stopgap thing. It could not have possibly have been preserved and it was not. Smith and Snyder were businessmen and apparently successful, but they knew nothing about theater. They thought they could just build this thing, lease it out and earn a passive income as landlords. That's not how theater works. If you wanna run a theater first, you build a saloon, then you build a coffee shop and a restaurant and a ladies wear shop and a men's wear shop and a dry goods shop. And when they're all turning a profit, you add a theater to the complex, the theater will lose money, guarantee but the theater will bring more people into that part of town and you will get more customers at your other shops. That is how you subsidize the theater. The theater serves a business function, but the business function is not to make money directly. Smith and Snyder did not understand that. That was a fatal error. Here we go. This is the first announcement for rent, Albuquerque Opera House. One store in front is already rented. They wanna rent the other one out. Big mistake. I was curious for years. I, I, I was actually losing sleep. Where was the opera house? And what on earth did it look like? I had some descriptions, but not enough to give me an idea. And then fortunately, by accident, I found this article. In 1935 Albuquerque Journal. It's a reminiscence. And it's not signed. I didn't know who wrote it. And somebody, I cannot remember who, told me that the author of this article was Billy McCrate, which would make sense as a plausible idea because Billy McCrate would have been an eyewitness to everything he writes about in this article. One thing he makes clear is that Albuquerque Opera House was kitty corner from the White Elephant Saloon. Aha, let's try to find more images of the intersection of railroad and second. Well, here's an earlier image, but it's from the same angle. So we don't see the Albuquerque Opera House. Here's a later image, which Mo Palmer sent to me. It's a photograph by Cal Brown, but again, it's the same, uh, same angle. So we still don't see the Albuquerque Opera House, but Mo pointed out to me, look at this, here's a boardwalk. This boardwalk straddled the Albuquerque Opera House. We're getting closer. So with the measurements I had, I drew uh, an image, a bird's eye view image of the Albuquerque Opera House, a saloon over here, a saloon over here, long entrance hallway, very narrow, a flat orchestra floor with uh, about 600 folding chairs, very narrow balcony with 14 private boxes, a box seat on either side of the stage, a 20, uh, either side of the orchestra pit, 25 foot deep stage. And once I plotted this out, I was really surprised by something. The footprint of the Albuquerque Opera House is comparable to the footprint of the state comparable to the footprint of the theater portion of the Sunshine Building. I was not expecting it to be anywhere nearly that big. I still didn't know what it looked like. Now, I have a number of books on theater of the time. I looked through every page. I couldn't see anything that would have resembled this structure. I started Googling and I found one theater still standing that I think is almost an exact twin of the Albuquerque Opera House. And you've probably been there. It's this thing, Garcia Opera House in Socorro. Flat floor, folding chairs. Looks like there's probably a tiny orchestra pit that's covered up over here. Maybe it held four musicians max. Box seat carved into either side of the proscenium arch. Watt ceiling could theoretically hold about 600 people. A uh, very small, narrow proscenium arch, not much of a stage behind it. And so whenever you think about 
Albuquerque Opera House. Think about this. This is probably about what it looked like. The very first that blew my mind. This is Milton and Dolly Nobles. They were one step away from becoming big timers. They were not barnstormers like the previous Williams Company. Milton Nobles was his own playwright. The Phoenix and in interviews were his own scripts. And I wondered how did they manage to get Milton Nobles in? And I thought, well, it's obvious. He had sent his advance agent to Albuquerque to inquire about possible venues. The advance agent learned that there was a new opera house being built and he booked the theater for four nights. As simple as that. So Albuquerque Opera House started out with a winner. And here's Dolly Nobles and her husband Milton, very handsome couple. I would, I wish I could watch them on stage. Uh, if they ever play again, give me a phone call. I'll buy a ticket. After about a week, Snyder and Smith find a renter for the Albuquerque Opera House. It's Thomas Kemp and his three business partners. It becomes obvious that Thomas Kemp and his three business partners know as little about theater as Smith and Snyder do. They think they can earn a living just by selling tickets at the box office. And very quickly, they learn that they cannot. Now, here is an early ad. Do you see the message in the ad? You, you have to know about the times. Back in the 19th century, most American theaters were brothels. And in order to indicate to the public that your particular theater was a legitimate institution and not a brothel, you had to put some messages in the advertisements. First that message is over here, opera. They call it an opera house. They don't call it a theater. Theater is a dirty word. Second message, ladies night. There are no ladies nights at brothels. This means this is a perfectly legitimate institution, family entertainment, bring the kids, nothing untoward will ever happen here. You have to know how to read these old messages. There's a press release a couple weeks after it opens, mentions that Bignon was good. And if you've ever heard the name Bignon, he pronounced it Big Don, really, he Americanized it. You're thinking about the same one. It was Joe Big Don. He was a regular. He was on stage every night for the first five months of the Opera House's existence. He was also a bartender at Doc's Place, which is Doc Monroe, who ran one of the saloons out in front of the Opera House. Here's an early ad. This one you should find intriguing because the sensational drama that they're presenting after the main show is Albuquerque by Gaslight, which is quite timely because Albuquerque had just gotten gas service. And indeed, the opera house was lit by gas. I've searched around for this script. I cannot find it anywhere. If you happen to have it in your attic, please let me know. I desperately want to read it. Theater has been open now for a month and two new actors come into town. They arrive at the train station, get off the train and the first news they hear is that you're out of work. The opera house has closed down. And we find out what happened. Thomas Kemp, the lessee of the opera house has been unable to pay the flyers. He's been unable to pay his musicians has been unable to pay his rent to Smith and Snyder, who in turn were unable to pay their rent to Nicholas T. Armijo. What was gonna happen? We can piece this story together. Smith and Snyder bailed out him. And they bailed him out by taking a loan from uh, the owner of a cigar and liquor shop by the name of William E. Talbot. And they started sniffing their noses around. What was wrong? Why was the opera house losing money? They thought it was losing money because Thomas Kemp handed out a couple of complimentary passes to his friends. 
So they laid down a new rule, no complimentary passes. If you want to see the show, you have to buy a ticket. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was much more fundamental. Now, the musicians now get four weeks of back pay owing, and they say, thank you very much. You can have your chintzy joint. We're getting out of here. They take the train. They leave town. The Opera House has no more musicians. Kemp and his people search around for a different kind of entertainment, and they find Boyd and Wade. Charlie Boyd, remember, Charlie Boyd and Tom Wade, who are vaudevillians. They had been around for about six years, uh, amusing audiences all over the U. They had gathered up a little of a couple of other uh, vaudeville performers. Boyd and Wade were very intelligent. They decided that theater is not a stable income so they became real estate investors. They had multiple streams of income, passive income, independent of anything they wanted to do for fun, which was appear on stage. They had also established a circuit of theaters. They contracted with a number of theaters throughout the Southwest US so that they could have uh, performers coming in and going out all the time, always fresh faces. Boyd and Wade, would rescue the opera house very soon, but instantly, as soon as they appeared there, they had problems. Problem number one, a concert hall is soon to be started in the city. It will be in competition with the opera house. Now the concert hall had a name, and very cleverly, the name of the concert hall was Concert Hall. Second problem, Georgia Alma, suddenly taken ill, had to go home and be put under the care of a physician. Georgia Alma was a regular on stage. She was Charlie Boyd's wife. He did not realize how ill she was. She thought this was just one of those things that happens to any actor. You get ill, you cancel a show, no big deal. This was a big deal, as they would find out. And getting back to the concert hall, we know it was somewhere right in here, right next to the European Hotel. As late as 1935, somewhere in this alleyway, presumably over an exit door, there, there was still a painted sign that said Palace Theater, which is one of the later names of the concert hall. At the same time they get competition, at the same time one of the performers gets ill and has to go home, Smith and Snyder are indicted for tax fraud. I have no idea what ever became of that case. And then it gets worse. Snyder built this wooden theater in 22 days, and now it begins to fall apart. Part of the roof falls in, water is gushing in all night. They have to cancel the show. Not one night, but two nights in a row. It's hard to read this one. So Smith and Snyder are desperate. They've got a loan from William Talbot that they can't repay. They're having trouble making money with the theater. Rent is unstable. They're being indicted for tax fraud. They have to do something. So they start renting out their lodging house. Their lodging house was the lodging house for the traveling actors so that the actors didn't have to bother with the, the trouble and expense of a hotel. Well, now tough. The actors are going to be going to hotels and Smith and Snyder are going to start renting out rooms in their lodging house. Now, Kemp, this really surprised me when I saw this. Kemp somehow managed to book in the Black Crook. And I didn't know how that could be because the Black Crook is a gigantic show. It could not possibly fit anywhere in Albuquerque. How did he get the Black Crook? I did some research and I, I found out the Black Crook ran over six hours. It was a mammoth scale. It had hundreds of people on stage. It was filled with catchy tunes from beginning to end. Uh, here are some advertisements for it for the New York show. And it gives you some idea of, of what this looked like. It was written specifically for this New York theater, Niblo's Garden, you can see the size of that theater, the scale of it. It had 100 chorines, 
on stage and these got all the guys' hearts palpitating. They went wild over these chlorines. That's one of the main reasons why the show was such a hit. When the New York run finished, I, I learned what happened. The show was scaled down. The script was cut, songs were deleted. The sets were reduced, the cast was reduced. So when it went on tour, what every city, village, town got was not the Black Crook. They got some variation on some excerpts from it and they uh, retweaked it to match uh, the local circumstances. There are some advertising cards. Uh, these actors in front are real. The people in the back, the set is all painted on canvas. And ditto here, and ditto here. And even though these advertisements are exaggerated, even though a lot of the action was just painted, it gives you an idea of the scale of the show. So when it comes to Albuquerque, where are they gonna put this up? They're gonna put it in a place like this. But what Albuquerque got was, as I say, just a couple of excerpts, maybe four or five of the songs, a few of the characters. And I know that when it got to Albuquerque Opera House, it was adapted because this is hard to see, but Laguna Indians were added to the cast. So, so they were Albuquerqueizing this show. Now, getting back to Smith and Snyder, William Talbot is calling his loan and he takes them to court. Now, concert hall is finally open, half a block down the street. And if the Albuquerque Opera House is gonna be so presumptuous as to put Laguna Indians on its stage, well, they're gonna fight back by putting Navajo people on their stage. But concert hall closed after just a few days. They couldn't pay the rent. So it seems that problem is over at least for now. Smith stays in Albuquerque, but Snyder and Kemp give up. They leave town leaving a legion of unpaid creditors who deeply mourn their departure. October, 1882, Boyd and Wade take over the rental of the opera house and they turn the place around. First of all, they change the name, Boyd and Wade Opera House. Secondly, they bring in a big hit show, Old Shipmates, as produced by Frank Mordaunt. They repair the hole in the roof. They repair the water damage. And here, in case you're interested, Frank Mordaunt, here is probably the only surviving copy of the play that he made famous. Boyd and Wade also hire musicians from Pueblo, Colorado. And then, William Adams Smith dies. Uh, earlier on when I said renting out the opera house was a fatal error, this is the fatality. And his obituary makes clear that the opera house led to his financial ruin, as of course it would. Joe Bignon or Joe Bignan, after five months of working at Doc's place as a bartender and working on stage at the Opera House as a stock actor, leaves town, heads off first to Tucson, and then he settles in Tombstone. And if you've ever heard of him, this is where you've heard of him. There he is. He married Big Minnie, who stood six feet, and the two of them opened the Birdcage Theater in Tombstone, which was the wildest theater in the entire United States. It's still there, you can still go in, still got bullet holes in the wall because there were gunfights during the shows. And that is Albuquerque's almost near scrape with infamy. Now, when Snyder built the opera house in 22 days out of wood, he didn't consider such uh, frivolous amenities as insulation and heating. And now it's mid-November, audiences and staff are freezing half to death. Boyd and Wade solved that problem. They heat the building. 
They're so popular that they filled the calendar. A second company wants to come to Albuquerque. They can't fit in the opera house. So Armijo House takes the overflow. Then Louis Lord, not Louis Lord, Louis Lord, Louis was a gal. They do a third show. Armijo House is booked, Opera House is booked. So they, their advance agent finds that there is a recently disused restaurant, Will Wall City Restaurant. We'll rent that. So now Albuquerque has three functioning theaters plus the concert hall, which is closed, four theaters. And Boyd and Wade, for some reason, bring in a spiritualist act. Uh, you're probably all familiar with spiritualism because you're all historians. And I still find it amazing that anyone ever fell for it, but people still fall for it. I don't understand why it makes me exasperated. Albuquerque Journal was only four pages. This one issue is six pages. I got curious. What are those extra two pages? I opened them up. And I saw something I was never in my life expecting to find. It's a broadside for the Albuquerque Opera House. The middle of it is obscured because it was stitched into the binding. But fortunately, the middle is the only part I knew how to reconstruct verbatim. I reconstructed it. This is Levitt's unit review at uh, Cork faced minstrels, acrobats, comedians, a one act farce. Some of these people went on to the big time. Levitt stuck around in Albuquerque for a few extra weeks because he discovered something. Albuquerque Jubilee Minstrel Troupe, they were amateur minstrel comics. And I think they're the ones he took under his wing and provided professional training. One of them, this surprised me when I saw it, Billy Sanguinette. Anytime you open an old Albuquerque newspaper, you see Billy Sanguinette. He was a proprietor of one of the two saloons in front of the opera house. He popped up on stage. He popped up everywhere. Uh, Diane forwarded me this lovely picture of Billy Sanguinette. Boyd and Wade also brought in William Horace Lingard, who was considered one of the top comedians in the US. He was considered one of the funniest people in the US. And here's William Horace Lingard, and here is William Horace Lingard dressed as his wife. More troubles. The Armijo brothers are now going to build a first class opera house. This is probably a development of that earlier Opera House Cum Theater, which some businessmen were contemplating. This is probably what evolved into San Felipe Hotel. And Boyd and Wade realized they could never compete against this. Then it gets even worse. Georgia Alma Boyd, who had previously gone home sick instead of performing, she has an accident. She was out riding a horse. The horse tripped, rolled over, fell on top of her. She felt no pain. She went back to the show that night. She performed on stage and felt fine. The next morning, she couldn't move. Uh, she, she was desperate for medical attention. This is 1883. What sort of medical attention are you going to get for internal injuries from a horse landing on top of you? The physician who attended to her was George Easterday. All he could do, this is before the days of microsurgery and common, commonly available x-rays, gave her hydrate of chloral, which is a sedative, and morphine, which is a painkiller. And he just hoped after that, that she would heal on her own. She did not, she died right away. Here's George Easterday. There were some accusations that he poisoned her with his prescription, but actually his prescription did nothing at all, did no harm to her. She had internal injuries. Now, another problem. This wooden opera house that was built in 22 days almost catches fire because of a stovepipe. They put out the fire with a bucket of water before it spreads. 
But it's another little bad, bit of bad news. This building is not going to last. What are they going to do? And there's another problem. Concert Hall, half a block down the street, is reopening as the Gem Theater, and they they insist on bringing in first class acts. So Boyd and Wade do the only thing a sensible business person would do. They give up. They abandon the opera house. They leave town. The Gem Theater, formerly Concert Hall, only lasts two weeks and it folds too. They can't meet the bills. The empty opera house is now available for little things like sacred concerts by the Sisters of Charity, but for the most part, it's dark. So, Gem Theater goes out of business. The restaurant was only used that one time. Albuquerque Opera House is out of business. Albuquerque is down to one theater only, and that's Armijo Hall, which is simply inadequate. That leaves an opening for this guy. You've all heard of Angus Archibald Grant. He started out as a contractor, bridge contractor for the railroad. He earned some good money. He started investing in real estate. With the profits he earned on that, he purchased his way into becoming a, a director of the, a director of the Territorial Fair and the First National Bank and uh, the water utility, the gas utility, the electric utility. He started his own construction company. The utilities at the time were not public utilities, they were private. So it wasn't this bad. I'm going to exaggerate for a bit, just, for, just to get a message across. It was never this bad. Here's my exaggeration. You want to buy a piece of land? You buy it from Mr. Grant. You want to build a house? You hire Mr. Grant's construction company. You want water service? You buy that from Mr. Grant. You want electrical service? You buy that from Mr. Grant. You want gas service? You buy that from Mr. Grant. You want a steak and dinner? You buy that from Mr. Grant. You, you want a, a, to rent a little shop downtown to run a business? You lease it from Mr. Grant. You want to treat the wife and kids out to a night at the show? You buy your tickets from Mr. Grant. That's who Mr. Grant was. Uh, Diane sent me something I'd never known about, and that was a memoir by Mr. Grant's son, Daniel. It's very short, it was lovely. Daniel Grant, just uh, the affection poured off the page. He talked about his wonderful family, the wonderful people he grew up with, all the wonderful friends he made through the years. When it gets to his dad, he has three cursory passing mentions and says nothing more. And that tells me all I need to know about Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant decides to put up a building uh, called appropriately the Grant Building. Jesse Wheelock over here uh, was the insurance agent for it. If I'm reading between the lines correctly, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I think the architect was Alexander McKay Whitcomb. I think the construction foreman was Edward Medler. And here, deliberately misspelled is Grant Opera House. We can see it's a brick building. There's a very narrow stairway up to the second floor. Second floor auditorium is flat. It has about seven or 800 folding chairs, which can be put aside for ballroom dancing. Sloped roof held up by trusses. I assume the trusses were wood. I assume the entire roof was wood. This looks like the ticket box. Stage was only 18 feet deep, which proves that Mr. Grant didn't know the first thing about theater because 18 feet is not enough. That's enough for amateur night. Professional traveling companies are going to insist on considerably more than 18 feet, 25 bare minimum. 15 foot proscenium opening, a very tiny little orchestra pit that holds maybe four or five musicians. Then we have this, Diane forwarded this to me from the city of Albuquerque. Uh, this is the best photograph I've ever seen of the Grant building. It was a very handsome building. 
Uh, the brick walls are very thick. The, this is Ilfeld's store here. This is the microscopic little stairway up to the second story. Now think about this. If there's a fire in there, and if there's 700 people crowded into the auditorium, how many are gonna be able to make it out down the stairways? Almost everyone's gonna be a crispy critter. This building, as nice as it looks, was a building that was gonna have lots of problems, and it did have lots of problems. Uh, strangely enough, the old opera house and the old concert hall open again under several different names. Uh, they do inferior shows. Here's a, a trained dog and a trained bear. They have boxing matches. They have wrestling matches. It's uh, really a disappointment. And Grant had opened his opera house. The first booking was Albuquerque Amateurs doing uh, Pinafore once again, I think for just a night. Second show was an itinerant preacher who gave a sermon. Third show was the Catholic Church giving Thanksgiving ball. The fourth show was a musician who just happened to be passing through town who was persuaded to do some Christmas songs on stage. As we see, Grant built his opera house, but he didn't know anything about theater. He thought he could just list this opera house as a space available and it would be filled with shows. That never happened. He did get some shows though. Milton Nobles and Dolly Nobles, their, their dance agent came out to Albuquerque. What's available? Well, Mr. Grant just built an opera house. Okay, we'll book that. So they book it for three nights, probably did well. The next show is not a show, it's a business meeting uh, for the railroad. Grant thinks he can lease his opera house out. He tries that for 15 years, nobody wants to lease out his opera house. Anna Eva Fay comes in, books a night as a, with her spiritualist act, there she is, who on earth would trust anyone who looks like that, but she made her money, I don't understand. A few shows started trickling in. Grant's Opera House was never open every night of the week. It, it was dark much of the time. It, it just wasn't, it wasn't a regular theater by any stretch of the imagination. These two came by. If they ever come by again, call me, let me know. I would pay a thousand dollars to watch those two on stage. They were major. Uh, they did a little play about David Garrick, which I would love so much to see. The palace, the, the old opera house now closes down and it's torn apart. The only part that remains is the front. And it's not until then that we get an illustration. And that's where Dick Brown comes in here. That is, we can enlarge it. This is a saloon in front. This is a saloon in front. This is the narrow lobby entrance, which is now converted into some sort of shop, I think a barber shop. These buildings are new. These, st these stand where the old auditorium used to stand. Richard Ruddy told me, pull out my Albu early Albuquerque book, turn to page 181. And I looked at it. I had seen it before. It didn't register. Here's Grant's Opera House. But I didn't know what I was looking at. But then I looked again, and bingo, those are the three storefronts that used to be connected to the Opera House. I thought, I thought it was brick when I looked more closely, but then I went to the office, I scanned the 600 DPI. That's a wooden side, just like it always had been. This is now Buckley's Saloon. It will later become Park Van Tassel's Elite Saloon. Richard also sent me this scan of a glass plate negative. So here's Buckley Saloon or later the Elite Saloon. I, uh, this is as close as we can see. It's got these two columns on it, which may or may not be iron, which may or may not be decorative, may or may not be structural. It's clearly no opera house behind this. And that's all we ever get to see of the old Albuquerque Opera House. Grant 
continues operating. Somehow, let me go back to this, Rose Eating came into town. I was never expecting Rose Eating to come to Albuquerque, but she came in. She was the number one stage celebrity at the time. How and why she came to Albuquerque, I can't even imagine. She must have been passing through and decided, why not? Let's do a play. Boyd and Wade come back into town and they ask Mr. Grant uh, if they can rent his opera house to do a vaudeville show. And Mr. Grant tells them he does not want any such disreputable people disgracing his stage. What else do you need to know about Mr. Grant? San Felipe Hotel is built no theater in it. And I wonder if somebody explained to the owners of San Felipe that you're not going to build a theater into your building, are you? Just imagining things. They got shows, they got good shows, old shows, new shows, minstrel shows, operettas, vaudeville, famous people, magicians, local talents, uh, living pictures, they got living pictures. They hire Benjamin Franklin Davis as manager. And I think that's Benjamin Franklin Davis who died in 57, I'm not sure. The advance agents explain to Benjamin Franklin Davis that they are not going to stop in Albuquerque anymore unless the stage is expanded. So Benjamin Franklin Davis expands the stage to 25 feet, cuts into the auditorium. And more shows, more shows, good, bad, it's an entire mix. Then there's possible competition here. In Old Albuquerque on the territorial fairgrounds, there was exhibition hall, sometimes called amusement hall. Now it would come to be called orchestrian hall and they offered regular orchestrian concerts. Do you all know what an orchestrian is? If you don't, I pulled this off of YouTube and I have to go out of slideshow to do this. Let me go back. Oh, screen sharing is stopped. Let me pull this up again. Um, hang on. Screen share, share screen. There we go. Share screen. Here's an orchestrian. So Let's Go ahead a little bit. gives you an idea from current slide. They were doing that regularly and uh, well, it's not quite competing with Mr. Grant, but it's, so, so it, oops, it's uh, on the edge of it. They bring in the old show, Virginia's, James Sheridan Knowles, Black, Black Crook comes back, Spartacus is in. The Buckman Farce Company comes in and they bring along a new novelty the Magnoscope. So this was Albuquerque's very first view of movies, April, 1897. After the Magnoscope, other people brought in the Triograph and the Animatoscope and the uh, Cineograph and various other things, various other types of early movies. Orchestrian Hall now plays a really dangerous game. They decide to muscle in on Mr. Grant's territory. They start showing movies as well. What does Mr. Grant think of this? He didn't have time to think. This is what happened to the Grant building. 
nobody was able to agree on what started the fire, how it happened. There were various theories. Uh, the most plausible theory is that it was the work of an incendiary. Whether it was or not, I do not know, but it would make sense. Mr. Grant says he will rebuild, but in his new building, he will not have an opera house. And Albuquerque celebrates. Orchestrian Hall starts doing a regular series of theatrics. Um, but Chechi and Jomi decide to build uh, their own legitimate theater, Knights of Columbus Hall. Frank P. McClure from Decatur, Illinois, comes into Albuquerque and promises if he can raise $5,000 in subscriptions to be held in escrow, he will build the best opera house that Albuquerque has ever seen. He only raises $4,200, but that's enough. He sees Albuquerque has interest in this. He buys three plots of land, Third Street, just a little south of Tijeras, and he subscribes a further $500 from the neighbors who are glad to do this because they want to get rid of all the undesirables there. Third Street, just south of Tijeras, was the red light district. It was called the Demi Mond or Hell's Half Acre. McClure hires Harry D. Johnson as his architect. And just as work begins, someone named Jesus Armijo says, hey, that sale is illegal. That's my land. You had no right to sell it. He never takes them to court, though. But right after that, Joe Badaraco, who's brother of Pete Badaraco, says, hey, you didn't have the right to sell that land. I own it. And he sues. So in court, the defense is that Joe Badaraco, yes, he paid for the land, but he put the title in his brother Pete Badaraco's name. Pete's uh, business partner is Angelo Viviani, so they have every right to sell. They, they claim in court that the only reason that Joe Badaraco put the title in his brother's name was because he was trying to hide money from his wife who was suing him for divorce. Now, because there are two claimants to the ownership of the land, the city treasurer has money tied up that can't be spent. McClure's wife gets desperately ill. He has to go back to Illinois to tend to her. And he leaves his architect, Harry Johnson, in charge. And eventually, or soon, he'll give, he'll grant power of attorney to architect Johnson. End of June, Johnson announces that the opera house is ready. It is complete and it costs $30,000 exactly as predicted, exactly as we contracted. So McClure tells the subscribers and the title holders that it's time to release your titles and money from escrow because the building is done. They all refuse. They say that McClure is guilty of breach of contract because the Opera House never cost $30,000. McClure's bills are due. He can't pay. One by one, his creditors start suing him. Now, McClure has already booked about 30 top-class Chicago shows who are coming to Albuquerque. Like it or not, there's no stopping them. They need a place to perform. Johnson switches sides and sues McClure for $1,500. Judge, the judge who's overseeing all these lawsuits realizes there's nothing he can do to prevent the shows from coming into town, so he has the court appoint a receiver for the Opera House. The Opera House is no longer called McClure's Opera House. It's now called New Albuquerque Theater, or as it was written on the front of the place, New Albuquerque Opera House. And unlike any other opera house I have ever heard of, it opens with an opera. Now, there are a couple of quick claims which settle things a little bit because there are so many liens on the building, no insurance company will insure it. And now there's more problems. Joe Badaraco has been going all over town blabbing that he's got this case locked up. He's gonna win. He knows it because he bribed an officer of the court to make it right for him. The court gets wind of that rumor and they halt the legal proceedings. 
launch an investigation and try Joe Badaraco for contempt of court. Johnson now switches back and agrees to, uh, to power of attorney from McClure and argues for McClure. Joe Badaraco and Angelo Viviani and their lawyer, someone named Finical, misread an excerpt of one of the judge's statements and misinterpret it as meaning that they are legally entitled to take forcible possession of the building. So they break down the outer door, they get inside, they break down more doors to get further inside and lo and behold, there is the architect, Harry Johnson, pointing a Winchester rifle at them. He sues them for damages, for breaking and entering and attempting to start a riot. They in turn sue him for having stolen 500 feet of rope from the opera house. The sheriff in the interim gives the keys back to Frank McClure. Now, the contempt case, uh, no one thought to pull out a pocket tape recorder and record Joe Badaraco blabbing the way he did. And so there is absolutely no physical proof of the bribe or of the rumors. So that case falls apart and the other cases continue. McClure now sues the attorney, Finical, Joe Badaraco and Angelo Viviani for $10,000 in damages for smashing down the doors. The court seizes the building and says, unless all the liens are satisfied in 90 days, it will auction the building off. Johnson switches sides again and now sues McClure for that $1,500 again. George K. Near comes in and decides to settle everything. He's got the money. He's the proprietor of the White, Ele White Elephant Saloon. He, pays, he buys all the liens, $15,000. He approaches McClure, says, I will buy your building from you for $1. And McClure says, gladly. He's glad to be rid of the thing. So the building, the land, is all in George K. Mears name. But the clerks at the court neglected to record that in the books. And so the court goes ahead and auctions off the building anyway. And the winning bidder is Otto Diekmann who wins it for $6,100. George K. Near hears about this and says, what the heck? How can the court auction off a building that I own completely? So he sues everybody under the sun. The judge uh, grants Near a temporary permit to operate the theater as though it is his own, pending the outcome of the legal case. Now here, I don't know where this photo came from, but it's the only photo I have ever seen of this building. There's an Elks Parade in the front, New Albuquerque Opera House. And under that, it says big burlesque. And a burlesque back in those days was usually not a girly show. It just meant comedy. Uh, here's Tijeras Drive up here. Here's Third Street. And he does run it and he runs some good shows as the lawsuits continue and drag on forever. Changes the name to Near Opera House and everything looks like it's gonna settle down except you know what happens. You know what's gonna happen. You absolutely know, you can predict it. This is what happens, it burns to the ground. Here, origin, a mystery. Well, the origin of the fire wasn't the mystery. The mystery was who set the fire. Uh, everybody unanimously agrees that that was a work of arson. Does this stop the lawsuits? No, the lawsuits go on for years and I haven't gotten to the end of them yet. I don't know how they end, but I've been blabbing now for an hour. So I'm just gonna stop it right here. If you have any questions, there's one chance in 30 that I might have an answer for you. So there you go. I can't hear a thing.